A huge thank you to everyone um, who is on the call today. Um, thank you for joining. Thank you for you giving up your lunch hour if you're doing that. If you're like me and you're in between your first and your second lunches of the day, thank you. Um, this is a really big topic, isn't it? Um, uh, at, at the moment, incredibly topical. It's, it's, it's a really quick, uh, rapidly moving space. Um, and we're really lucky to have a really fantastic panel of speakers to hopefully make this a really good session um, for everyone who, who is on, on the call today. Um, just before I introduce the speakers, um, I, know, I know from uh, looking at those who have signed up that an, a number of you know my kind of future really quite well, which is fantastic. For those of you that don't, um, just to give um, a couple of minutes of context on who we are as an organisation and, and, and really why um, this as a topic is so close to our heart. Um, we are the UK's largest underrepresented talent specialists. Um, we work with, you can see some of the employees on the screen, we work with employees in pretty much every single sector. Um, and really we exist to support young people from the world of education and to take their first steps into employment. But particularly those who are from uh, often overlooked or underrepresented backgrounds. Um, you know, it might be barriers put in place by geographical constraints or because of their social uh, mobility status. Um, so we support them to take their first steps um, into employment through the partners we work with. Um, but also through a blended approach of um, having a very large school and college network. So we typically run around a thousand engagements a year with schools and colleges up and down the country. Obviously, at the moment, we're pivoting most of those to be going digital, um, but also through technology um, and through our student engagement platform, Connector, which has supported about 40,000 young people to engage with employers over the last couple of years. Um, so we know it's a really, really confusing time for young people at the moment as they, as they are looking at leaving, um, particularly for those who are taking their first steps out of the safety net of education and into the world of employment. The, uh, everything that's going on in the world at the moment has only made that harder, but it's really confusing time for employers too. And lots of you will be uh, rapidly looking at how you can flex the well-laid plans you, you, you've put in place and, and, and might be thinking about how you can digitally um, engage with schools and young people instead. And um, with that in mind, we're really, really lucky at My Kind of Future to work very closely with our teacher advisory board who help ensure that the projects we run with our partners don't just give impact for the employers, but also keep the young person at the heart of, of absolutely everything we do. Um, and so we're really, fun, really, really lucky to have a couple of those members, um, Theo and Laura, who are both uh, extremely busy uh, or, or working at the moment in school. So a big thank you to both of them for their time today um, and also our fantastic head of uh, school partnership, Steph. So I'm going to give the guys um, 30 seconds just to introduce themselves. Just before I do that, I just wanted to very uh, briefly run through the um, agenda for you for today. Um, there's a lot of noise around digital at the moment and um, it's uh, a really rapidly moving space. So our hope is from today that you come away with some really clear uh, tips and insights from the experts who are living um, and breathing what's going on in the school space um, day in, day out about how you can tweak um, your school or young person strategy so that it really lands um, and resonates and has impact in, in, in the months ahead. Um, we'll give you a quick moment in time snapshot of what we're seeing from employers and, 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 and how employers in the wider space are, are reacting to the challenges that go on. Um, and then we'll move on to the panel discussion, which will make up the, the, the most of today's session. Now, the key parts of the discussion have been informed by um, you, our attendees, and our wider employer network. So a big thank you to those of you who um, filled in the survey beforehand. And, and what I would say is if you didn't get a chance to, um, uh, to, to put your questions forward, please do use the chat functionality as we go along. You can either um, ask uh, a question straight to Hannah, my colleague, if you want it to be anonymous, um, or you can um, label it directly to, to a member of the panel. Um, and finally, just before I hand over to Steph for an introduction, um, we, we know it's a very big topic. We're, we're not going to be able to cover everything that, that there is today. So um, at the end of the webinar, you'll see details of where you can sign up to get a free workshop um, and follow up a bespoke follow up report from uh, my kind of futures experts on your schooling and person engagements for the year ahead. So, so do take us up on that. Um, Steph, is it okay if I hand over to you first just to give a bit of an intro and context to your role here? 
Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Will. Um, pleasure to be here. At my kind of future, I'm head of school partnerships. Um, so what that means in practice is that myself and my team lead on all the activity um, that we deliver on behalf of clients that engage young people, um, be that through schools or directly to the young people themselves. Um, and that spans um, secondary school um, up to graduate level. Um, so definitely the voice of the end user, the voice of young people and hopefully schools um, but really uh, excited to have some people on the ground um, that are working in schools as career leaders on this webinar um, to kind of give their voice as well so um, Laura I'll hand over to you for a, a quick intro. Afternoon everyone, so my name is Laura Warner and um, I'm the Head of Careers and Work Related Learning at Burntwood School which is in Tooting in South London. Uh, my background is teaching, I'm also a geography teacher so I'm kind of coming um, at this from both a sort of teaching and a careers perspective which is I think quite quite an interesting way to approach it um, and currently starting to think about how we're going to best support our particularly A-level students next year. Fabius um, and then Theo a quick intro would be great thank you. Yeah. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Theo Shembanjo. I'm the Careers Guidance Practitioner at Haberdasher's Asks Hatcham College. Um, I came into careers having worked in finance for a long time and I wanted to retrain. So I became a psychotherapist and I specialised in careers and did the Level 7 Masters in Careers Advice and Guidance with the QCG qualification. Um, I've worked with Steph and the team at My Kind of Future for a long time. We've done a lot of projects with them from the likes of Dent to Aegis um, to Tata Consulting. And I'm here today just to talk about how we can actually work during this period and get the most out of careers, employability, face-to-face -face advice and guidance using technology um, through this webinar. So thank you for having me, cheers. Thank you all and, and, and really looking forward to the discussion in, in, in just a minute. Um, just before we, um, uh, we, we, we pass over to the panel, um, just to give um, everyone on the, on, on the call a bit of a context into um, what we're seeing um, in the wider space from employers and, and, and how they're reacting. And, and there's a really fantastic report um, up on the uh, ISE site, which, which contains more, de more detailed findings. But just to give, to give you a bit of a sense, um, we're expecting school leave uh, recruitment numbers um, in the autumn term to be around a third lower than, than they were at this time last year. So it's a real big hit for young people who, who are looking to, to move into the, the world of employment straight from school. And um, now that's contextualized with, you know, it does vary massively by sector. So the built environment is going to be about 70-75% uh, lower, it's looking like it will be. Um, and unsurprisingly, pharmaceutical um, roles are actually going to increase. So obviously it does vary by sector, but, but, but overall quite, quite a sustained um, and quite a large drop. Um, looking at what tends to happen during recessions it may well be that as the confidence grows in the economy towards the back end of 2020 or, or early 2021 numbers may start to pick up again slightly but certainly we expect um, in the months ahead at the beginning of the autumn term that employers will probably be, be, be cautious with what they do um, and just for a bit of further context their graduate numbers are only down by about 12 percent so it really is it's those who, uh, school leaver roles which which are being uh, being hit the hardest and um, if we move away from talent pipeline in a little bit and I know that some of you will be coming um, at this more from a diversity or a work experience or, or CSR perspective um, obviously there have been a real impact um, in the number of work experience programs that have been cancelled the number of workshops uh, with schools or colleges that have been cancelled or, or having to go digital um, now, typically, these are the engagements where we see really the greatest impact for young people that might lack a network of mum and dads who are in a certain sector who can support them um, to, 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 to help them to understand what an industry is like, to help them uh, gain the confidence and, and, and gain connections that they might otherwise lack. So the reduction in those activities is only going to make it harder for, for, for young people from disadvantaged backgrounds to um, access the high quality and information and skills that they're going to need to, to succeed as, as they enter the world of work in the first instance. So it may well be that lots of those social mobility or diversity gains which certain industries have, have, have really improved upon over the last few years are wiped out and and as always in, in, in you know when, when the economy's hit hardest it, it may well be that, that those most disadvantaged are, are, are hardest hit. 
Um, no real data on it either, but just anecdotally, you know, budgets are also being very heavily scrutinized for employers. You'll probably all know that. So um, an even bigger um, push than normal to, to, for employers to, to make sure that any activity you run um, is, 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 is having real return uh, on, on the investment that's being made. So it does look like quite a bleak picture, but um, from the conversations we're having and, and again, the data that shows that employers are still really, really keen to keep channels open with schools and colleges. And even those, and, and, and lots of you won't know your hiring numbers for next year yet or what your work, workshop activities might be able to look like, um, but still keen to keep those channels open, which is, which is really fantastic. And, and there is a commercial advantage to that too, in that we do see that employers that, you know, uh, keep, um, are keeping those communication channels open with schools and colleges are likely to be at the front of the queue when competition really starts to hit up again between employers to, 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 to get in front of schools. So with this in mind in the snapshot we've just given, um, we um, put a survey out to our wider employer network and, and, and many of you responded on the, on, who are on the call today, so thank you for that. Just to try and pick up the, the key themes that were concerning you or that you wanted, um, uh, you wanted more clarity on to give you confidence in, in how you could best engage with schools and colleges in what are gonna be some quite challenging months ahead. Um, the feedback was fantastic. It was really broad and, and, and there was great depth to it. So thank you so much. That will inform most of the discussion that, which you're about to hear. Um, we've, we've done our best to, to break it down into three uh, main themes because of the time we've got on the call today. Um, and these are the, so the three key challenges that, that sort of shone through. Number one was employees wondering about how they can best um, engage with a diverse and broad range of young people digitally. Um, also then thinking about actually, well, what do digital alternatives to engagements with young people, what should they look like? So if we're running a workshop with young people digitally, what are the key features that separate really good engagements for the, and, and apart from those which just won't land for young people? And three, how do we best build long-term and meaningful partnerships with both schools and, and young people in the months ahead? So those are the three key themes to, to, to what the panel will be discussing and um, Steph will also be giving further context from uh, our wider schools network who we also put a similar survey out to just to, to give further contextualization to, to the answers that are given. So those are the themes. Steph, if you're ready, I'm, I'm, I'm going to hand over to you first for um, our first question. Um, and I think it, it really gives some, hopefully some, for the employees on the call, some really useful further context. And, and it's a big question, so apologies, panel. But, but what, will, what, what do we think schools will look like um, uh, in, in the autumn term? Um, yeah, I'll absolutely kick us off. Um, what will schools look like? That is the big question for, for obviously all of us at, at My Kind of Future as it is for, for anyone involved in education. Um, so I, I'm not going to say too much on this. I would love for, to hear uh, what Laura and Theo are hearing um, from their schools and, and for our employers to hear that as well. Um, one thing that we do know um, and that we're working with at My Kind of Future is that there will be little or no face-to-face -face engagement um, between employers within schools or will be in the workplace um, definitely in autumn term. Um, so we're, we're looking at that now. We're putting out various products and offers that, that enables the impact for young people to still happen and that career inspiration to, to still happen, but without that face-to-face -face engagement. So that's kind of the big thing for us at, at My Kind of Future. Um, but Laura, from you, I don't know if you have um, greater insight into to what your school especially is going to look like in autumn term. Um, so I think from from our perspective, the kind of new buzzword has been this idea of blended learning that because of the size of schools and because of the number of children that we try and support, there is no way that we're going to be able to have all children in school for the foreseeable future. So there's definitely going to be a mix of home learning and school learning. Um, we haven't been able to put any trips or workshops or any kind of out of school activity in our calendar until for the whole of the next academic year and I think from a sort of careers perspective the sort of time allocated to careers is likely to be reduced as there's more of a focus on the kind of key curriculum areas where students have missed quite a lot of work and also careers often falls into a sort of PSHE area of our curriculum which also supports kind of the personal social emotional mental health um, education and it is likely that that 
the need for that will increase and the need to talk about anxiety and bereavement um, and well-being and things like that so I think um, career still has an important space but one that might need to be a little bit more strategically planned yeah and it definitely sounds like that space um, that you know all of us are always fighting for in terms of um, getting careers on the agenda within schools that's we're just going to have to share that uh, with maybe more more important things um, or equally as important things at this time as you mentioned and and Theo um, is it looking similar or, or different at your school? Um, it's looking similar I think the new normal is very much this you know concept of staff and teachers remote working and working from school so even if you're at school you can still reach out to students who are at home um, and then it's students themselves either being at school if they're timetabled in so we've got next week um, from the 15th we've got 50 year 10s coming in every day at my school so that's what we're going to be doing um, for secondary sick formers year seven year eight um, year nine and year 11 are all receiving remote teaching from home so that's what they're doing one of the main differences for us is that um, careers doesn't sit part of PSHE so PSHE is separate um, so what students have been doing they've been participating in activities and events like we're doing today which are webinars and talks um, and these have been pre-recorded some of them and some are live streams as well so they're actually part of our day-to-day -day teaching curriculum so what I've been doing is I get like a calendar invite from the curriculum planner and then you know they, they're booking the time out so one of the ones that we did recently was UCAS and we had a university there with me so we were talking on that um, so I would kind of pretty much expect that to be the norm I think it's all about schools kind of getting used to it um, but there's been a lot of different activity with you know organizations like yourselves everyone really kind of fighting for this space so to say um, but I think the good news is that because of you know pre-recorded content students can actually access things now throughout you know there's no kind of time limit mm. you know i've had students now sadly emailing me about ucas you know them panicking or thinking about it um at 12 midnight where you wouldn't have had that before um but because you know we have the new microsoft teams capacity and things like zoom these are the kind of things that are happening so i think it's a mm. time of definite op opportunity Fab, thank, thanks here. That's a really positive um, outlook on it as well. So thank you for that. It sounds like the teacher's working day is going to be 24 hours then. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, it's correct. I mean, we've literally got our same school timetable, but it's just digital now. Um, so we've got 200 a year group and 200 in every year group are participating in all these different lessons. It is a core curriculum and then the core curriculum is supported by um, what they call extracurricular activities. So within that careers comes into it, PE, fitness, all of these different things. Um, but I've had it myself every week, 90 minutes a week with every different year group. Wow. That's and, That's and, amazing. And, 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 and so on that point, you know, it, we've said it's a, bit, a busy space but, but digital is going to have to be the way forward it looks like for, for, for employers um, and, and their engagements with you um, in, in the months ahead. Um, Sefka maybe if I come back to, back, back to you first um, for, for, from what you've seen here at MKF are there any sort of key themes from the best methods that, methods that employers are using to engage digitally or, or should be engage, using uh, in the months ahead? Yeah, so um, you've touched on it uh, there, Will, in terms of all the face-to-face -face activity that we had planned for this summer term and next term. Um, we're pivoting all of that activity to a digital or virtual offering. Um, so they include, uh, Theo mentioned webinars, we've got um, digital work experience, digital workshops. So really um, all the products that we would normally deliver face to face, um, we are able to deliver virtually. Um, and we have been doing that with some of our, our current clients. Um, so there are some real key products that, that we do utilize. Um, and at MKF, we really are in a unique position to build those solutions for employers and schools. Um, and so we're able to um, look at what the schools need, what would best suit them um, and what the employers can offer and hopefully join them and match them. Um, but Laura, it would be great to hear from you in terms of with your school, um, what methods are you seeing that, that students engage with? What can employers utilise um, at this time? So I think um, it's really interesting to hear about, about Theo's school because from, from my kind of school perspective, we're actually having a lot more difficulty with students accessing materials online. So we've got quite a high number of disadvantaged students and spent quite a long time 
kind of trying to allocate laptops to, and computers and things to them but even where their family does have a laptop we're sort of seeing okay maybe they do have to share that between both their parents who are working and three other siblings so i think the methods often still need to be more teacher facing so we one of our sort of biggest existing um employer engagements pre-covid was to have a, an employer into school every single week to do a um, talk to year 12 and year 13 students and that's something that we essentially want to continue through recorded videos um, probably over webinars in order to be able to get the students to access it at the time that is convenient to them. So the way that we normally do that is that we give a kind of um, format, okay, can you tell us about um, the sort of career options into your journey, whether that's university, apprenticeships, um, how you entered your profession, um, any skills that you need particularly for your job, any A-levels, any other extracurricular activities that would benefit um, someone thinking about going into that industry. So I think um, so that recorded material that is quite personal and speaks to students on a, this is what I did, this was my journey, because yeah. there's so much information out there at the moment that I think we lack that personal touch often, and that's actually what's gonna become more significant now. Mm -hmm. um, with that in mind, the virtual work experience, which we're definitely seeing grow um, really significantly at the moment, I think will become a big area for development. Um, in my school, that at the moment is really focused with year 12 and year 13 students, as we're not quite sure how to manage the safeguarding element of it with younger students at the moment. Um, but I think particularly the kind of insight days and on one, two, three day projects um, are definitely more popular at the moment compared to the week-long ones as students are trying to balance their curriculum learning um, and other careers opportunities as well. Yeah and that's a great I love the point you made about needing personalization in a time of uh, digital expansion and, and making sure that remains at, at the core of what we do. Um, I think there could be you know it's easy to go digital and, and, it, and things to feel less personalized so I think that's really important. Um, and Theo, is it, is it similar for you? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I mean, one of the things I did, um, I am an ambassador for the Haberdashers Company. So we've got lots of different schools um, who sit under the same umbrella. And what I noticed is that, you know, lots of young people had questions. Um, so I was fortunate enough to actually be able to set up a YouTube channel where when students actually sent me questions from my school, I was able to actually post them to YouTube because just as Laura said, um, where laptops are concerned, you might have a family sharing a laptop, but most students do tend to have a smartphone. So being able to actually access webinars and those kind of pieces of content from say the, the direct internet link is something mm. that's really vital. There can't almost be like a kind of paywall where a student have to sign up, you know, click in and log in. It has to be immediately accessible information. So I've actually had many of my students who've participated in some great virtual work experience opportunities and some really good webinars. But some of the feedback has been some of the things actually getting into them, it's been quite difficult. So, you know, if a student has to create a login for a website, you know, it's not necessarily something they would prefer to do. They like to access information like on Instagram or something where you just click it, the link opens on their phone um, and it's really easily digestible for them. So what I've tried to do, we have at my school got um, a Microsoft Stream account. So that's internally, so nobody can see it outside of the school. So I've been posting videos to that. But externally, as I said, um, I have been putting um, answers to student questions on YouTube as well. And that means that students are able to access it at any time. Yeah, and that's really key, isn't it? Being, I think you've made two great points there in terms of easy accessibility for students and, and at any time, which is a huge benefit of a lot of this activity going digital. Um, fabulous. Thank think, you. Just, sorry, just one quick thing to add as well, is that trying to use the language which students know, like students use YouTube and Instagram and Snapchat all the time. But actually, if you ask a 14 year old, did they want to participate in a webinar? Do they know what a webinar is? Do they know what's involved? And actually, when I think about the confidence that quite a lot of our students have, um, particularly relating to careers activities when they're maybe in the younger years, then probably not going to engage with something that they're not really clear what's mm -hmm. expected of them, how they do it, whether they need to talk or have a video mm -hmm. on, etc. 
yeah it's really there's a lot of new things for them to kind of grapple with at the same time yeah no that's definitely true and I think I think that point in itself, I think that leads on really nicely to, to, to our next question, which I guess is a bit more of a deeper dive into um, those digital alternatives. And, and, and from a school and young person's perspective, when an employer is thinking about what they can do, what are the key features that you see in digital that do support the young person to those which maybe they just don't understand or, or, or don't land and maybe stuff come to first? Sure. So um, the key thing which um, I hope I speak on, um, on behalf of a lot of schools is, is that even though we're pivoting some of this activity to digital, we still really need to try and meet those Gatsby benchmarks. Um, in some ways, it, it's slightly easier when you go digital a lot. You know, as Theo said, young people can access it at different times. You can get a much, much wider reach. Um, but we just need to have those in mind. And that's definitely something at my kind of future and um, with all the activity, even if it is digital, Digital, we're still trying to attain and hit those benchmarks. Um, I'm sorry, Seth, are you just able to uh, give a bit of clarity on what uh, the Gatsby benchmarks are, just, just for the audience? Yeah, sure. So the Gatsby benchmarks mm. are um, eight, eight benchmarks that schools um, um, have to meet um, in order to um, provide a great careers education programme. Um, so the, the various things like engagement with employers, um, engagement with the workplace, access to HE information, um, and there's ways that um, schools can uh, uh, mark their uh, provision against those benchmarks. Um, and the goal is to, to kind of fulfill those benchmarks. And that's when a school has a fantastic careers offering. Um, so with all the activity that, that we do and that we offer to schools, we make sure we're really clear in terms of which benchmarks the activity hits. So, um, you know, it, it, it's going to help you or support the school to um, meet criteria or benchmark five, for example. So we're just making sure that with all digital activity that we do the same for that so that we're still supporting the school as, as well as that young person. Um, and, and we think it's really important that even though we're going digital, that young people still hear um, directly from employers. So having that voice, um, a bit like Laura, you were saying about having that personalization um, and a voice directly from the employ employees. Um, so it might not be face to face, but it can still feel um, quite intimate and, and personalized. Um, and having some mechanism for feedback between the student and an employer um, so not necessarily feedback on their work but some sort of interaction is is great um, not all digital offerings can can offer that but that's fantastic if that is involved um, and we've touched on it as well but really stringent safeguarding measures that that we can prove to the schools and career leaders um, are in place as well so just some thoughts from me but Laura great to get your thoughts on that as well I think the thing that um, really strikes me is that we've got quite a lot of students feeling a bit overwhelmed by this <laughs> this idea of the new normal and suddenly having to try and do their work from home where they can't put their hand up and ask teachers questions all the time. So I think there's got to be really clear purpose to it. I think the sort of tangibility of the opportunity is really important. Um, so something that we're seeing at the moment seems to be quite successful is kind of gamifying opportunities. So students are seem to be more engaged in um, sort of things that are posed as a competition. So I've seen quite a lot um, of opportunities available at the moment. So whether that's sort of like an essay competition, if it's something slightly more academic, or um, I saw that Ricks were doing a programme um, or doing one for next year um, that was related around a sort of project to do with surveying. And there were, I mean, th there doesn't necessarily need to be a significant prize. Maybe they're featured on their projects featured on their Snapchat or their some sort of social media or something like that um, or equally um, opportunities which do use those medias as young people are engaged with so maybe they have to make a video of something that they've done or an idea that they've got and they post that on Instagram with a hashtag and um, the other thing I think is that it's really important to think about all the things that students can do during this time when there are so many things they can't do so when I think about actually we've done so much work in recent years on raising aspirations and doing a lot of work with the younger students, where the workshops were really a really important part of that and kind of employer visits. But actually what's going to carry on is students are still going to apply for apprenticeships, students are still going to apply to university, students are still going to apply for jobs. 
So I think opportunities need to be really focused around those elements that are sort of non-negotiable. So whether that's kind of webinars around um, writing personal statements, which schools do support students with, but maybe from specific universities or industries, um, interview skills, writing a good job application, what the what they might envisage recruitment to look like in three or four years time perhaps mm -hmm. when our A-level students are applying for jobs. I think there needs to be quite a tangible focus on things that are, are purposeful to the young people and that they can see really relate to them. Fantastic, thank you. And Theo, your thoughts? Yeah, I think that um, just to answer the question about the digital alternatives, I think in order for them to be successful, they need to be really easy to access, number one. Um, I think it's really important as well that employers don't just see the digital offering as being something that they um, potentially just put a little bit of resource into. So, you know, it's like a web page where it's really useful if it's like an introduction video or this is what it's like at this company. So the student actually buys in um, and invests in the process. I mean, I saw a student the other day doing virtual work experience and you know they were getting we transfer files and it was something that was clearly a useful um, you know experience that was you know seen as being useful the whole company through so they were invited to a zoom call with the whole company on a zoom call welcoming them that kind of thing so it's really just about ensuring that the digital processes whatever they are still come with the same value added because in many ways from my perspective what I can see with the Gatsby benchmarks is that it is almost easier to deliver them as digital because you know you're just sending things out you know it's almost like sending out a mailing list but in order to get value added meaningful engagement from students and also valuable outcomes which is having attended this i am now going to go into this industry or i'm not going to go into this industry mm. it needs to also have that element of critical thought put in as well so I think the things need to be accessible. I think it needs to be meaningful. So all of the things that take place are really, really meaningful. And I think there are some great opportunities because with something like say virtual work experience as an example, or a virtual project, which I've seen some companies do as well, it removes like the need for, we can only take one student. Maybe 40 students can do it, maybe 50, maybe 80. So, you know, I was even thinking about the challenge that we did with you guys with Dentsu Aegis. Mm. And I was thinking it would be the perfect time, you know, for the code, <laughs> you know, to launch the code now, because I can see that the student engagement, they've all got a mobile phone, um, would be through the roof. Whereas I know when we were reviewing the student engagement before, we were kind of thinking, how do we engage them? Mm. So mm -hmm. it's really, I think it's a unique opportunity and I don't see many downsides. The only downside that I see is that anything that happens has to be meaningful. Um, mm. And I've seen that with university webinars. So some universities have put webinars on where it's just a student recruitment exercise and students and their parents can see through that immediately. Mm -hmm. But if the university have invested in it and it's a lecture from the course lead, you know, Brian Matthews, who's a you know, geneticist or something like that. And, you know, he was mentioned in the Nobel Prize. Then the students are really excited. But if it's just we've got a head of admissions who's going to talk to you about coming to study maths here, they can see through that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the two different things can have, you know, absolute uptake and then someone can say, ah, I don't want to go there. So it's just really important that the things that happen are meaningful. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a that's a, such a good point, isn't it? We have to remember it's a journey that students are going on from education to the world of employment. The chance of them uh, applying to a company off the back of a one off event is, is probably minimal. So the more touch points we can have with them, the more support we can give them to guide them on that journey, I think, is where real impact happens. Um, I, I, I'm just looking at, at, at the time, and Hannah, do come if you want me to hurry, hurry up even further, but maybe on, on, on our final question before we move to Q&A, if we could maybe just give one, one or two top tips each um, on, on how employers can start to build uh, meaning, really meaningful relationships with you as a school and, and, and the young people um, within your school. And maybe Steph, I'll just come, come back to you again. Yeah, sure. So um, I'll go quickly. I just got a few points here. Something um, I think is really important to al allow the school direct access to a single point of contact within the employer um, to make it as easy. You know, they're really career leaders, are really busy. Um, they get a lot and sometimes inundated uh, with offers. So having a direct named person within that, uh, in, within your organisation will be really useful. Um, 
I would say um, engage now. Um, let's not, as employers, let's not say we'll engage when we can do face to face again. We don't know when that'll be. We don't know how that will look. Um, so engage now. If you know, if schools need it now, listen to our teachers here. Speak to teachers. What do they need? Um, and, and, and offer that now. Um, and then finally, you know, I think at my kind of future, there is a place for the intermediate tree. So. We obviously have um, great connections and links to career leaders nationally. Um, and, and now's a great time to engage with intermediate trees like my kind of future to, to start and support you in building those meaningful relationships. Um, but yeah, Laura, over to you on your thoughts. Yeah, so I think kind of similar to what Steph was saying that as careers leads, we are largely lucky enough to be overwhelmed with offers, but I think a lot of those are quite generic. So actually when I think about the sort of email marketing that we get, some, I mean, I'm going to skim read it. And if there's not something really clear and tangible that I can see, or if it's not an area an industry where we don't have a contact, that email's going to go in my bin essentially. Um, I think that the, uh, the immediate contact made with schools needs to be really specific. We're running this webinar on this date for this purpose or click on this link to find out our program. Mm -hmm. I think as well in terms of our, the sort of quality assurance nature of it um, is one of the reasons that we use and work with My Kind of Future because we know that the, the resources coming by them are targeted towards the Gatsby benchmark, are checked they're streamlined they're part of a wider careers program and i think that using those intermediaries is really important for us and will probably become more important as we're likely to become slightly more overwhelmed with um emails and, and offerings um so i think there's definitely a place to to kind of do it through a through an external partner in order to access schools on a slightly larger basis yeah absolutely hopefully it helps to streamline those offers a little bit in terms of what you receive so instead of employers going directly we can streamline that a bit further but theo as well it'd be great to hear your thoughts yeah i'd say uh, first and foremost don't be scared to get involved you know it's so easy to change a young person's life um, i had an employer last week um, who works at bloomberg and they were able to give an introduction tour to their office of what it looks like during COVID. And then they gave the students some activities that related to trading. And it was amazing just seeing, you know, the, the tangible impact that it had. And that was on a group of 80 students. So, you know, where previously, when I've had, you know, my kind of future in, unless we're doing a giant workshop, it's usually been with a class and a class usually only has 30. Um, and then that video was watched again by many other students who said, you know, can I get involved? Can I get involved? So whatever you do, um, the activity will be well received. Students are at home with their parents watching this stuff as well. So, you know, the reach of it is really, really vital. So I just encourage you to just get involved. The team at My Kind of Future are really great. And, you know, careers leads like myself and Laura, we're always ready and waiting to hear, you know, the latest opportunity or direct things to students. Um, so, yeah, I didn't really want to say anything else, but yeah, please get involved and, you know, please engage because there's just so much that can be done now. Where beforehand it was very difficult because you kind of think I've got, you know, one assembly every month, mm. almost now, where students have different interest groups. So you could have students who are interested maybe in engineering, students interested in finance. You can actually send something out and it's going to reach all of the interested students and everybody. Um, and that's something I've definitely noticed at this time. Amazing. Thank you so much, Theo. Yeah, guys, th thank you. Thank you all for, 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 for that. I think that was, that was hugely helpful. And I actually found that quite, quite positive. That was really uplifting and maybe more so than I, than I thought it was going to be. So, so look, that's, that, that's brilliant. And um, before, before we just do a bit of a summary, um, Hannah, can I just pass um, back over to you quickly just to um, check if any questions come through or anything else that um, uh, we, can, we can cover while we've got the panel here? Sure. Thank I have, you um, sorry, Hannah, I did just get a notification from someone as well. Um, and so um, thanks, uh, Phil, for, for drawing my attention to this. And the, the CEC have published some guidance today about online engagement and what criteria and features that engagement needs to have in order to meet Gatsby 5 and 6. Um, so we can definitely send that out following this if, if you haven't seen it. But I think that's really impo important for employers to see as well. So you can see the sort of features that your activity needs to have in order for schools um, to find that really useful. So um, thanks for, for uh, raising that. Um, over to you, Hannah.
Thanks, Steph. Thank you, Steph. That was fab. Um, so we've had a couple of questions come in. Um, the first one is um, has asked, does the Gatsby benchmarks also apply to colleges, not just schools? Yes, yes, it does, yeah. Fabulous. Um, and then a just a couple more that have come in. Um, have you got any tips for engaging students who may not find online sessions easy or possible for a variety of reasons? I think because we are likely to be seeing more students, hopefully sort of a consistent upward trajectory of more students in school. And I do think there's definitely a role for kind of teacher led resources. So when I refer to those sort of video um, that can be shown online, but actually when we've got students in school, there is time available to sort of allocate to those sessions. So I think just because it's digital, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be shared with students independently. A lot of that will still come through schools, like um, Theo was saying with the YouTube videos and things. They are, there are mechanisms for those students to access things during school. Because of the way that we can't send a student anywhere, we can't have anyone in, I think that, that is sort of inevitably the only way we can do it. Um, but just because students don't necessarily have access at home, it doesn't mean they have, don't have access at all. Uh, thank you, Laura. Is there any more thoughts on that before I move over to the next question? Um, no, I, th I think that's covered it. I mean, um, th some of the products that we offer, they're not all digital, even though this is a digital time and uh, we're pivoting a lot of it digitally. There are still some, some uh, products that we can offer um, to engage with young people that's not, that doesn't mean they have to engage digitally. So there's still options there. Fabulous. Well, thank you all. Um, and then um, the next question is, um, what are some examples of meaningful digital volunteering engagements for my staff? Um, so in terms of volunteer engagement, um, we really focus on that at My Kind of Future. So it's a huge part of what we do. So when we um, outline the activity we're going to uh, propose with schools, uh, we also look at what how can the employees engage and as i said before it's a huge part of making it really impactful and meaningful if the students hear directly from employers um if uh, the activity utilizes our platform connector then we have digital mentoring which is a great uh, way for employees to engage um uh, and, and volunteer their time the time that they offer up really depends um but that is a great tool for it um, we can also um with our digital Digital workshops there's a space for employees to um, do a bit of a Q&A and, and talk about their personalized career journey that that Laura mentioned so that personalization piece and um, so they can come and speak in it in a workshop be that live or recorded um, so it really depends on the product but um, there, there should be a, a real still a real wealth of opportunities for employees to volunteer um, when, when we go digital uh, thank yeah, you, I, so I would definitely second that about um, about the mentoring. I think that's something we're really looking into um, quite closely and, and particularly um, thinking about some of the stats that Will shared with us at the beginning that students from disadvantaged backgrounds um, are likely to struggle more as a result of, of COVID sort of through employability and through other areas and, and we're definitely always looking for particularly sort of young and BANE role models at my school we have a very um, sort of big cohort of Muslim girls and so um, student, well young women from Muslim backgrounds um, to be involved in mentoring roles is something that's sort of really sought after by my school. Um, perhaps, thank you, thank you Laura for adding that. We. Um, uh, I've just had a few, another few questions come through. So um, we had a question from Fatima that was asking what our process was, is it of engaging young people with careers related offers? Um, is it something that teachers would recommend students to participate in? Um, so there's a variety of ways we, we do it. Our main way of um, engaging, promoting opportunity students is through career leaders. Um, so we have the network of career leaders nationally and we go to them and really they're, you know, Laura and Theo, they're the conduit to, to get our message and activity to the young people. Um, they, they know the young people best um, who might engage and they have the, the 
of communication streams to offer that. We do do some direct um, marketing to end users, uh, not as much as, as we do in terms of going to career leaders. There's also some activity that we do that requires um, recommendations from teachers or career leaders. Um, so they're kind of the opportunities that um, where students have to apply or there's a set criteria so um, it's really important that that we um, we have those connections with the career leaders so that's, so that's the main way we do that um, in terms of the new guidelines for, for five and six um, there was another question about that and I can definitely send that over um, but the, what the CEC have done, have, they've said to include an activity under benchmark five and six, these are the following re requirements it must have. So, for example, for benchmark five, learning outcomes must be defined based on the age and needs of the students. Um, so there's sort of three for, for benchmark five and, and four for benchmark six. Um, but we can send that over um, following this. I think someone has just shared it. In the chat as well which is great thank you for that Jess um, and and then another question Laura for, for yourself and Theo can you advise them what is really important for them to see from employers right now yeah I, I would say one of the most important things to see right now is um, diverse representation but also diverse qualifications as well so students very often uh, have a stereotypical conception of an area job title role how you get into it so one of the things i got into yesterday for a group of students was the fact that when students refer to uh, the industry being business they don't mean entrepreneurship they mean financial services and what kind of qualifications do you need to get into financial services well the answer is what the person i had with me at the time um they actually studied drama at university so it was about showing students that you do, you can do an apprenticeship in financial services but you can actually go to university study something you're really passionate in uh, you may do an internship so that person did an internship while they're at university um, because they had some voice difficulties um, in finance it went absolutely brilliantly they'd never thought about it before it challenged them and they now work in finance and they're a director of trading so I think it's really important that you know the diversification in terms of qualifications or lots of different things really encouraging students so they get an understanding that there's a lot of pressure on them so you don't necessarily have to decide today that you want to be a doctor you know this is something that you can have an idea of but you may deviate you may change you may study it you may change your mind so it's really important that students see that diverse spread mm, absolutely really well said thank you Theo and, and Laura is there anything additional I think the thing that I would highlight is kind of focusing on the word now is that actually between now and the end of term, I sort of, I don't want to speak necessarily for all schools, but we've actually got quite a lot of resources now to take us through until the middle to the end of July, considering that the year 10 and the year 12 students we're going to see, we're only going to physically see five times mm -hmm. between now and then. And then it's the summer holidays. We don't really know what's happening with that, whether provision for some students is going to be in place or not. But really what I think is important is to spend the next couple of months thinking about what you can offer us in September. Because actually, schools sort of operate on this yearly basis, and we do do a lot of curriculum planning really far in advance. So you might have this great idea for Careers Week in March, but if you only share that with us in February, there's not a huge amount we can necessarily do with it. Mm -hmm. So have almost your year's program, or at least some ideas about what that's going to look like that you can share with us September, October, so that even if that resource is only available in February or March, that we can start to plan that into our offering now. Perfect. Thank you. And, so and, and Laura, sorry, just just to, um, to come in on that point. Um, what a fantastic uh, point. And um, please, um, employers, just just another nudge towards the um, focus group with, with people at my kind of future. My, my details are on there. That's exactly the type of insights and support Steph and the team can help give you. So, uh, yeah, put, please, please, please do follow up on that. Hannah, have we got anything else coming in? And I'm conscious we've, we've probably run, well, we have run we a little bit over. We have run over time. I think we'll allow, I've got one more question. It'd be mean to let that one not be answered. Um, so um, it's just come in from, um, so what, how are you delivering workshops virtually? 
Um, so in terms of my kind of future, we, we have um, different workshop ideas um, and offerings depending on what the outcome is. And so we have one that is based around more attraction work and we have one that is more inspiration. So, you know, attraction and pipelining to your organisation or inspiration and getting them interested in your sector. Um, so the, the models kind of differ um, we are having, um, you know, it's going to be a, a mixture of live content from our tutors still being able to deliver that workshop, um, but also um, employers can choose whether that is live or recorded, whether tutors are involved or whether we produce enough resources to empower um, the teachers um, to deliver that as well. So it really depends on the outcome, but we, we do have a few models that kind of speak to, to the different outcomes. Um, and, and involve sort of live and recorded uh, content. But as with a lot of the um, activity we do at My Kind of Future, the session will still involve that challenge element um, and activity that, that uh, people know that we deliver in our content. So that will still be uh, very firmly in place um, in those digital workshops. Perfect. Thank you, Steph. And then just one more flag, um, just to everyone. We will be showing the contact details of everyone on the panel today in our follow-up comms, so you can get in touch directly as well. Cheers. But, uh, Hannah, have we just lost track? Any, any final questions or should we wrap That's up? That's it for now. That's it. Thank you. No, uh, just, just from me, a, a, an opportunity to say a huge, huge thank you, uh, Laura, Steph and Theo. I, it's an incredibly busy time for each and every one of you, I know, um, and I found that hugely insightful. So I'm, I'm really sure all of our attendees have too. So big thanks from me. Hannah, huge thank you um, uh, for, for, for putting the session together too. Um, and as I said, please don't follow up with us here at My Kind of Future. Um, you know, we, we see it as our responsibility to keep ensuring that young people have equal access and opportunity to engage with fantastic employees such as yourself. So let us help you make, make, make that come to life in the most impactful um, and resource friendly way possible in the months ahead. So big thank you for me and um, stay safe and have a good rest of your, your Wednesdays, everyone. Thank you. All. Thank you. All. Thank you very much. See you soon. Bye.